subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello there. You are welcome to the Senior High School R on your Joy Learning channel. It is another privilege to go on a mathematical experience together. Thanks for choosing this channel. If this is your first time, we are grateful you chose us. And if you're one of our regulars, thanks for keeping faith with us. Today, I have the privilege of taking you through another elective math experience. And I would be glad to do that if you would go with me. Today, we'll be treating mattresses. I am your facilitator, Danso. Once again, you're welcome. So, straight to our topic, mattresses. What is mattresses? And why do we need to study it? Well, a few objectives we have on our minds. When we would have completed this topic, you should be able to do a few things. First, you should be able to define what a matrix is. Well, you should be able to recognize and correctly apply matrix notations. You know, mathematics, we love notations. Indeed, it's our language. So, you should be able to correctly recognize and apply those notations. You should be able to recognize different types of matrices and um, identify and use equal matrices. Now, that is a big one. Quite a lot of things around this topic revolves around the equality of matrices. So we shall consider that together. And finally, you should be able to perform very basic arithmetic operations on matrices. So let's begin. What is a matrix? What is a matrix? You probably have something else in mind, especially if you are a millennial. And for those of you who are watching me now, the majority of you, I suppose, are millennials. So you probably are thinking of something like this, right? Or its sequel, that. You are thinking of Matrix or Matrix Reloaded. Well, that 1999 blockbuster movie directed by the Wachikosi siblings was a hit, a real big hit. So sometime in 1999, this hit our screens. It wrecked in a very commendable figure, almost $450 million of viewership and payments, etc., etc. The Wachowski siblings did a good job of directing this movie. And till date, it still remains one of the finest science fiction movies you've ever watched. What has this got to do with our mathematics topic? Or what has it not got to do with our topic? Quite a bit. So we'll try and understand where they diverge and where they converge. So Matrix. What is a Matrix? And why was that movie named Matrix? Well, you recall Mr. Anderson in the movie trying to fight an computer system called the Matrix that had created a distortion to the world, creating a dystopia of a sort. Well, let's see how all of that works. Let's see why it was called the Matrix. And let's understand why it's mathematical in the first place. So what is a Matrix? A Matrix, by definition, is a rectangular arrangement of a set of elements. So whenever you can arrange any set of elements, and here by elements we mean numbers or and symbols, where those symbols could be variables, uh, A, B, C, X, Y, Z, alpha, beta, gamma, all the way to omega. In fact, those elements could even be expressions, as you would see down the line as we go on. So whenever we can arrange any set of numbers, alphabets, expressions, in a rectangular form, we have a matrix. Now, the plural for the matrix is matrices or matrices. 
Of course, it could be spelled with an X instead of a C. So instead of M-A-T-R-I-C-E-S, it could be M-A-T-R-I-X-E-S, matrices. All right, and the numbers could be complex or real. Just any set of numbers. Anytime we can arrange anything, anything from a dance group to cars in a parking lot to um, security guards to electronic systems, numbers, if we're just dealing with pure math, anything, so long as they can be arranged in a rectangular form, we can call that a matrix. Now, it's because the word matrix originally means a container. And that is why in biology, we would call any female organism or animal kept for the purpose of reproduction, we'll call that animal, that female animal, a matrix. So it's another word for a womb. In geology, the matrix will be the parent rock from which another rock is built. So whenever we can pull out a thing from a main thing, the main thing is called a matrix. So any sort of arrangement from which you can pull out things is a matrix. All right, I hope that understanding is clear. Okay, so matrix or matrices are arranged in a very interesting form. And I must pause here to drive this a little strongly and home. Matrices are arranged in rows and in columns. Why am I pausing here? It's because there is this pension for describing rows and columns in the interchanged but wrong form. So whenever you arrange things from left to right and they are in line, that's a row. A row is from left to right or right to left, depending on what you choose, where you choose to begin. So from left to right, if things are arranged in line from left to right, that's a row. If they're arranged from front to back or back to front, top to bottom or bottom to top, that's a column. And that is why in a building, that vertical um, piece you see in a building that holds the roof or holds another floor is called a column. If you're used to a spreadsheet, then you would notice that the intersection of a row and a column will give you a cell. For metrics purposes, the cell will be the location of an element. So in your classroom, if your classroom is arranged in such a manner that a student sits behind another student and the other behind another student until you get to the last person, then that arrangement is a column. So if a teacher is facing that sort of arrangement, then he is facing those in the column. So perchance your classroom, you are arranged in such a way that you have students sitting in such an arrangement where one person sits behind another and the other behind the second all the way to the last person. And there are such arrangements. You have columns. It is very um, usual to hear people say, oh, those of you on this row stand up. Well, what the person intended saying correctly would have been, those of you on this column stand up. A row will be all those sitting horizontally, if the teacher were facing them from left to right or right to left if they are in line. Of course, there are some classrooms where people are arranging a curved shape so that everybody sees everybody, etc. That would not exactly be a rectangular arrangement. But if it is a rectangular arrangement, in which case it's a length and a breadth, then from end to end, left to right, or right to left, that would be a row. And front to back, or back to front, up, down, down, up, will be a column. Please take note of this, because it leads us to another important concept. So what is a matrix? Let's go over that again. A matrix is a rectangular arrangement or array of a set of elements, which could be numbers, alphabets, variables, symbols, etc. These alphabets, these elements, are arranged 
horizontally and vertically so that horizontally we have rows and vertically we have columns. Now, when we have this kind of arrangement, we should be able to describe the arrangement. So let's attempt describing the arrangement. We have that arrangement called the order of the metrics. Matrices have order. And that's the beauty of math. Indeed, beauty could be characterized by three things, by proportion, by order, and by symmetry. Let's deal with order for today. What is order of a matrix? The order of a matrix, we're trying to check what, how many rows do we have as against columns. So a matrix is read or said beginning with the rows. All the times, the row is how we begin. So, if I'm going to describe a matrix for you, I will describe the matrix by reading or saying, first of all, the number of rows that exist in that matrix. So, or if I write it and I'm, I have finished writing it, then the written form could be read in terms of how many rows as against number of columns. So, the rows are typically characterized by the alphabet M and the columns by n. So we say we have an m by n order matrix. m by n order matrix, where m is row and n is the number of columns. So let's look at a few examples. On your screen, there are three examples. I want you to hazard guesses. What kind of order do we have for the three matrices? And this is a rectangular array. If you notice, we have arranged them. They look like rectangles. Now, when I say rectangles, I do not mean the bracket. I mean the order in which it is arranged. So you notice they are in line. There's a horizontal line or horizontal lines in some cases and vertical lines. Now, you notice that negative 8, for example, in our first example, bottom left, is just behind or below one. So that's an arrangement. We have another arrangement. We have one, four, three. They are arranged left to right, so that's a row. So if you look, notice in the first case, we have a two by three matrix. Now there's a usual confusion here, and let me try to clarify for you. The two by three means that if we run horizontally, that would be one row, so we call this row one. And then there's a second row, row two. So that is where the two there comes from. Column, like I explained earlier, will be up, down, down, up. So we have column one, column two, and column three. So we have two rows and three columns. So that is a two by three order matrix. Now, what about the second one? I want you to try that one. Can't try it. Okay, let's verify your answers. So the second one, we have a three by two matrix. So there are three rows, one, two, three. Row one, row two and row three so three rows how many columns do we have columns are up down one two so column one column two so that's a three by two matrix the last one did you guess it right yep it's a three by one matrix now i want you to note something that in the first two examples i use the curved bracket. In the third case, I use a square bracket. Why? Well, no special reason. You could use any one of them and you'll be right. I prefer, just a personal preference, to use the curved one. I'll tell you why as we get down the line. By the way, these are the basics of matrices we'll be dealing. As we go on to subsequent lessons, we would go into deeper waters and don't be afraid. I'll be there to guide you. Finally, we should be able to launch into the main deep and fish out great things in terms of application where we hope to end this topic in the future. So we have dealt with the definition of a matrix 
and now we are done with the order of a matrix. Now let's go to notations. In mathematics, we are big on notations, and this is elective math. Once again, if you're just joining us, you are welcome to Senior High School R on your Joy Learning channel. My name is Danso, and we have been treating matrices. So far, we have dealt with the definition of a matrix, and we have also looked at the order of a matrix. Now we want to look at notations, because in math, we are big on notations. That's our language. So you need to learn to speak it and speak it right. Now, how do we represent matrices? There are different ways we represent them, and you need to get familiar with them. This particular topic is notorious for having a lot of terms and terminologies. If you have a handle on those terms, then understanding this topic becomes pretty easy. So let's look at the notations. We have the double suffix notation. By double suffix, we mean that we could write the element or of, of a matrix in a very unique way. So we have, for example, on your screen, S subscript IJ. Well, it could be any other alphabet apart from S. It could be A. As you will find out subsequently, certain alphabets are reserved in the same way that if you were creating an email, for example, certain symbols are reserved. Uh, you would not be permitted to use them because they have special functions and so you cannot touch them. It's almost like in a parking lot where a particular spot is reserved for the boss or for some security agency, etc., etc. All right, so I can use S because it's not reserved. So S subscript IJ notation or the double suffix notation. So we have a matrix say S. That matrix S, where I, the I in the subscript refers to the number of rows, while the J represents the number of column or the column position. So if I had S say 1, 1, it would mean, for example, that that element is in the first row, first column. So let's look at an example. So we have a matrix S, and this is, what order is it? Yes, it's a 3 by 3 matrix. It is a simple way to tell if it's in a double suffix notation. You will notice that the last element there will have the order fully described by the subscripts IJ there, 3, 3. Now, for this particular matrix, we have S11 all the way to S33. Now, if we had, say, that same matrix defined by 5, negative 7, 6, 0, 11, 4, 3, 8, negative 2, we could say that S subscript 2, 3 will mean that that particular element, and remember we said all the items in the matrix are called elements, it means that particular element is in the second row, which is this row, and it's in the third column, third column. So that's four. S subscript 3, 1 will mean that it is where? Remember, I is for row, J is for column. It will mean that it's in the third row, and it's in the first column, 3. S, 1, 3 will follow the same order. First row, third column, 6. And S, 2, 2, S subscript 2, 2 will mean it's in the second row, second column, which in this case is 11. So that's the double suffix notation. So whenever you see such a notation, it tells you exactly where to find the element. It's like the address system of a matrix. Indeed, this is one of the things you use in your GPS system. We'll talk about that in the future. All right. There are other notations. So we have the whole matrix notation. What does that mean? In a typed document, in text, when we want to describe a matrix, and it is a whole matrix, 
and I'll distinguish that from a row or a color matrix very shortly. If it's a whole matrix, so it means that it has the number of rows and number of columns greater than one, that matrix is typed in bold um, capital letters, bold capital letters. So in this case, we have matrix A, which is a two by three matrix. So you notice that the A is bold. Now, that's in a typed on a text form. Now, what if it was not, so for example, we have 6, 2, 3, 5, negative 1, 7. That's matrix A. So instead of writing matrix A, I can simply write A. If it is typed, then I make A bold, like you have on your screens. But if it is written, then I could simply write A capital, write my elements in the curve bracket, and that would be matrix A. But we like to do something significant if it is handwritten, and that would be to draw a wavy line below the A. If you notice, this A below here is different from the other A's representing matrices above. So what do we do? We'll write, draw a wavy line down here. The wavy line like a tailed below it. Now, truth is, even if you do not write it, you could be pardoned, but for clarity to distinguish it from, say, a vector or any other, it's a great idea to put the wavy line below it. So it's either you just write A, you don't need to dip in it, you could just draw a wavy line below it, and that will be a whole matrix notation. Let's see other notations. So we could have a row matrix. In a row matrix, it simply means that there is only one row. Whereas in a column matrix, there is only one column. So in this particular matrix, matrix B, you notice the alphabet is bold, but it is in a lower case. Lower case, it's not capital B, it's a lower case B. And this is one row, three columns. So it's a one by three matrix. While matrix R, again, because it is not whole, it is a two by one matrix. It is written in, typed, sorry, in bold lowercase. It could be written in another way. Again, this time around, if it is typed, to show that it is a row matrix, you notice we have B subscript J. The I has been omitted because I is one in this case, it's a row matrix. In the second case, it is R subscript I. The J has been omitted because there is only one column. So there is no need to write the one. So it's bold with a subscript. If it is written, then you could write it, like we said before, small letter B, you don't have to deepen it, or small letter R, you do not have to deepen it. But you could do something. The same thing we did to the whole matrix you can do to the row and column matrix, that is, draw a wavy line below it. That will distinguish it from, say, a point in your coordinate geometry system. So that is our notation for whole matrix, column, and row matrices. All right, let's deal with types of matrices. And hello there, there are lots of matrices. I'll deal with a few, the much you will be needing for this basic level of your education. As you go higher, you would encounter others. But these ones, you would encounter even on the higher level, and they are very special. Okay, so let's begin. We have a square matrix. You notice it's in red. It has two cousins, who, which will also come in red. They are special, and that's why they are in red. We'll talk about why they are special, their uniqueness. A square matrix is a matrix that has equal number of rows as columns. Remember your square, yeah. A square has equal length, breadth, equal. Okay, so a square matrix has same number of rows as columns. So usually we'll say it's an M by M matrix. So the N gives way for another M because same number of rows. So a two by two, a three by three, a four by four, etc, etc. 
That's a square matrix. We have a row matrix. We've encountered it. It's a matrix that has only one row and whatever number of columns, usually greater than one. So a row matrix could be a 1 by 3, a 1 by 2, a 1 by 4, on and on. Its compatriot is a column matrix. It has only one column and a number of rows. So it could be a 2 by 1, a 3 by 1, a 4 by 1, etc. Then there is a single element matrix. In a single element matrix, there is only one element in the whole matrix. So effectively, it's a 1 by 1 matrix. Only one element, no other element, just one. Then we have a special one, the unit or identity matrix. Now, a unit or identity matrix is one that has all the elements in the matrix as zero, whereas on the leading diagonal, which is a new term I shall explain shortly, on the leading diagonal, you have va a value 1 on the leading diagonal. Now, so you have a matrix. I'll give you an example so you get to understand. You have a matrix. All the elements are 0 besides the elements in the leading diagonal whose values are 1. All right. There's a diagonal matrix. A diagonal matrix is almost like a unit matrix, except that the definition is broader. In a diagonal matrix, besides the leading diagonal, all the other elements are zero. Except that in this leading diagonal, or sorry, in the diagonal matrix, the values in the leading diagonal could be anything other than one. So they could be three, two, negative one, etc. They do not have to be precisely one, as will be the case in a unit matrix. You get it? In a unit matrix, in the leading diagonal, all the elements have a value 1, whereas all the other elements will be 0. In a diagonal matrix, the elements are all 0, but in the leading diagonal, it has values which could be 1 or values other than 1, but they are not 0. Finally, there is a 0 or null matrix. In a 0 or null matrix, all the elements in the matrix have a value 0. So when you arrange them, every element is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, whatever the order may be. It's a 0 matrix if all the elements are 0. So these are a few types of matrices. We'll get to see one or two more as we go down the line. Keep these in mind, especially those in red, because they'll be visited again and again and again throughout your learning of matrices. I hope you're catching your breath to take some notes and you're following this lesson. All right. So these are the examples. A square matrix. This is a 2 by 2 matrix A. And matrix B is a 3 by 3. So you notice three rows, three columns, square matrix. Now, what is the leading diagonal I kept referring to? Well, it goes by other names. It could be called a principal diagonal, a primary diagonal, a major diagonal, in fact, a good diagonal. So any of these names you hear mean the same thing. What is that leading, primary, principal, major, main, good diagonal? What is it? This is it. It runs from top left to bottom right. So that diagonal, corner to corner, from left, but top left to bottom right, is the leading or principal or good or major or main or primary or principal diagonal. If that is it, what do you call the other diagonal? Remember, we say it's a rectangular arrangement or array. In every rectangle, there are two diagonals. So if one is leading, or good, or principal, or main, or major, or good, then the converse must be true, which is that the other one must be in the opposite direction from top right to bottom left. 
and they are called anti-diagonal, counter-diagonal, secondary diagonal, trailing as against leading diagonal, minor diagonal as against major diagonal, off diagonal as against main diagonal, and bar diagonal in contrast to good diagonal. So the one in red is the anti-counter trailing or bar diagonal, while the one in blue is the leading principal or good diagonal. I shall be using the word leading diagonal most often. Maybe once in a while, I could use principal or main or major referring to the same leading diagonal. So that's the leading diagonal. I hope you're okay now. So when we talk about um, a unit or identity matrix, these will come back. Okay, so a row matrix, that is an example. That's a one by two and a one by three for matrix P and Q. By the way, that should have been in small letters, not capital, because they are unit matrices. And then we have column matrices as well. This should have been in small letter G and small letter H. Okay, so, and then we have the single element. I just put pi in there because it could be a symbol. So we have pi as our single matrix S. All right, our units or identity matrix. So you notice that on the leading diagonal, we have one, one for matrix, and they're all named the same I because they are identity matrices. Why are they so called? We shall get to find out very soon. While the other elements are all zeros. So that's an identity or unit matrix. Then we have a diagonal matrix. Again, in this case, you notice that all the elements aside those in the leading diagonal are zero. But in the leading diagonal, we have two, one for matrix F and one negative one, negative one for matrix J. So it's a diagonal matrix, but it is not like the identity matrix in the sense that the elements in the leading diagonal could be anything other than one, whereas all the other elements will remain zero. Then that's the null or zero matrix, where all the elements are zero in nature. Okay, so these are examples of matrices. Remember, we are covering the basics of that topic, matrices. Let's go to equality of matrices. What makes two or more matrices equal? A few conditions to meet. First of all, two matrices are equal if and only if all corresponding elements are of equal value. So if I have two matrices A and B, the two matrices are equal only if corresponding elements are equal. In other words, the element in row 1, column 1 of the first matrix A must be of the same value as the um, element in row 1, column 1 of the second matrix B. And this must be true for all other elements. No exception. If even one, just one of them, is different, the two matrices cannot be said to be equal. They must be equal, not just equivalent, they must be equal. So in this case, matrix A will be equal to matrix B if and only if A11, that is subscript 11, is equal to B subscript 11, all the way to A subscript 22, equal to B subscript 22. They must be the same, each one of them without fail. It is an uncompromising condition that must be met. What that means by inference is that the order of the two matrices must be equal. They must be the same. So a two by three matrix cannot be equal to a three by two matrix. The order must be the same for both matrices so that the corresponding elements will have same value. So given a problem like this, given that matrix A, reading from row to column, is given by eight, x minus one, which is an expression, five minus y row two, and negative two, 
for a two by two matrix. And we'll have another matrix B given by P plus two for the first element, two X second element, first row, three and negative two. The question is to determine the values of P, Q, sorry, P, X, and Y. Now, the condition is very simple. To solve this, we state the condition. Matrix A must be equal to matrix B only under one condition. The condition is that all corresponding elements must be equal. In other words, 8 must be equal to P plus 2. X minus 1 must be equal to 2X. 5 minus Y must be equal to 3. And negative 2 must be equal to negative 2. By doing that, drawing those equations, P will be equal to 6, X will be equal to negative 1, and Y will be equal to 2. And there's a simple way to test if we're correct or wrong. Let's put P as 6 in matrix B. We'll have 6 plus 2, it gives us 8, which corresponds to the 8 in matrix A. If we put X as negative 1, in matrix A and B, we'll have for matrix A to be negative 1 minus 1, which gives us negative 2. And for matrix B, 2 multiplied by negative 1 will also give us negative 2. And if we substitute Y for 2, we'll have for matrix A, 5 minus 2 will be 3, which will be equal to the 3 in matrix B. So for any two matrices to be equal, their corresponding elements must be equal in value, all of them, not some of them. All right. Now we're going to perform a few basic arithmetic operations on matrices. And at this point, we shall be hoping to draw a close to today's lesson. What are the arithmetic operations we're going to perform on matrices? Very basic. We're going to add, we're going to subtract, and we're going to multiply. Well, I have not spoken about division because essentially division is multiplying something by its reciprocal. Let me give you an example. What is 10 divided by 2? 5, right? Yeah, 5. But we can also think of 10 divided by 2 as 10 multiplied by 1 over 2. So I have simply reciprocated 2 to have 1 on 2 and I multiply it by 10. So we do not divide matrices in the, if you like, usual way we would division. We would multiply a matrix by the reciprocal of the number which we intend to divide it. So if we intend to divide a matrix by, say, 4, we will simply multiply that matrix by the reciprocal of 4, which will be 1 on 4. So let's begin with addition. First of all, let's give the conditions. Two or more matrices can or may be summed on one condition that they are of the same order. If they are of this different order, no, we cannot add them. So an M, an M by N matrix cannot be added to an N by M matrix. It will not work. So the order must be the same. 2 by 3 added to 2 by 3. 3 by 2 added to 3 by 2. 1 by 4 added to 1 by 4. 4 by 3 added to 4 by 3. 4 by 3 cannot be added to 3 by 2. It will not work because you must add corresponding elements. Okay, so we have these matrices. And I want you to quickly take a note of these four matrices. Take a quick note of these four matrices, matrix A, matrix B, matrix M, and matrix N. You would note from what I have just said that some of these matrices can be added, others cannot. So which ones can be added? Matrix A and M can be added because matrix A and matrix M are both two by two matrices. They have the same value in terms of order. Matrix B and N cannot be added 
because matrix B is a 2 by 3, whereas matrix N is a 3 by 2. They cannot be added to themselves, neither can they be added to any other matrix in this particular instance. You get the idea now. Please take this particular matrix, these matrices down. I'm going to give you an assignment on them, so let's take them together. All right, so let's give an example. If I was to add matrix A to M, what would I do? As a solution, I will simply add 3 to negative 8, 1 to negative 3, 6 to negative 1, and 2 to 10. And you see that expression to your rightmost on that line. If you evaluate that very simply, 3 plus negative 8 will give us negative 5, 1 plus negative 3 will give us negative 2, and 6 plus negative 1 will give us 5, positive that is, and 2 plus 10 will give us 12. Very simple. You simply add corresponding elements. Be careful with the negative values. They are very tricky. Okay, so subtraction. How do we subtract? Same condition. The order must be the same, else you cannot subtract. So an M by M matrix cannot be subtracted from an M by N matrix. It will not work. Okay, so just an example for you to note. So let's subtract matrix M from N. Again, it will be 3 minus negative 8, 3 minus that. 1 minus negative 3. Now, remember, I say take note of the negatives. It's not 1 minus 3. It's 1. The minus is different from negative. Minus is an operation. Negative is a place value or a place sign. So 3 minus negative 8, 1 minus negative 3, 6 minus negative 1, and 2 minus 10 gives us a new matrix. 11, 4, 7, negative 8. So we have subtracted matrix M from matrix A. Now the assignment I'm going to give you is, the first time we said matrix A plus M. Now we said matrix A minus M. I want you to switch it. For your assignment, I want you to do M plus A and M minus A. So you just switch sides and let's see what we have. We're going to multiply matrices. Matrices are multiplied in two ways. We can multiply matrices in two ways. The first is to multiply by a scalar. So we have a matrix, then you multiply that matrix by a scalar or a scale factor. The scale factor could be anything, practically anything. Usually, it could be a number, a real number. It could even be a complex number. It could be a variable. So let's multiply. So it multiplies them separately. So we have matrix R, which is a 2 by 3 matrix. And we're going to multiply it by a scalar factor K. What you simply do is to multiply each element by K. So K R subscript 1, 1, K R subscript 1, 2, all the way to K R subscript 2, 3. And that's how we multiply a matrix by a scalar. So let's do an example. Let's multiply matrix R by negative 5. If we do that, we would have these. And when we multiply negative 5 by negative 2, and by all the others, we'll have 10, negative 20, 0, negative 5, negative 30, and 5. That's multiplying a matrix by a scalar. Finally, we're going to multiply a matrix by another matrix. The condition for this one is critical. Make a note of it and watch how we go about it. You can multiply two matrices only if the number of rows, sorry, the number of columns on the first matrix is equal to the number of rows in the second. I'll take that again. We can multiply one matrix by another matrix under only one condition. If that condition is not fulfilled, 
you cannot multiply a matrix by another matrix. What is the condition? The number of columns in the first matrix must be equal to the number of rows in the second matrix. For example, M by N matrix must be multiplied in such a way that the second matrix is N by any other thing. So if I have a 3 by 2 matrix as my first matrix, I can multiply by another matrix whose number of rows is 2. As for the number of columns, it could be anything, and it doesn't matter. It could be just anything. But these two must be equal. The moment they are different, you cannot multiply them. You get the idea. So that is how it works. If this condition isn't fulfilled, you cannot proceed. So before you multiply, check. The number of columns in the first, is it equal to the number of rows in the second? As for the number of columns in the second, which is this, it could be anything. By the way, when you have finished multiplying, your resulting matrix must be of the order this, 3 by m. So the resulting matrix, if you fulfill the initial condition, will be the number of rows in the first by the number of columns in the second. That is, assuming that the number of columns in the first was equal to the number of rows in the second. I hope this was clear. All right, so let's do a quick example. We have these matrices. Remember we had them earlier. Please take note of them. I'll give you an assignment, and then we will bring our class to a close. So matrix A can be multiplied by matrix B, M, sorry. A and M can multiply because a 2 by 2 can multiply another 2 by 2. We also notice that matrix B can multiply matrix N, because I have here a 2 by 3 multiplying a 3 by 2. My resulting matrix would be a 2 by 2. However, aside that, no other matrix can multiply themselves. It will not work, unless, of course, the number of rows in the first equals number of col I mean columns. I mean number of columns in the first equals number of rows in the second. So this is your assignment. Let's determine the following. I'll give you the answer to one. Show you a certain property for the second, and we'll close our day. So take these examples or take them as your take home assignment. So AM will give us this. Now watch how we multiply. We multiply row by column. So three multiply eight, one multiply one. You get that? Then you sum them. So three by negative eight plus one by negative one. You notice how we go. You got that? The second time, we go 3 multiplying negative 3, 1 multiplying positive 10. That's what we have here. So when you multiply, you go almost like a 7, row by column. Let's take a step backwards. We go 3. Now, let me clean this so that we can go together one more time. Three multiplying eight, three multiplying negative one. That gives us first case. Three by negative eight, one multiplied by negative one. That will give us the first element in the resulting matrix. The second time, we'll do the same thing. We'll go 3 
multiplying negative 3 and 3 multiplying 10. Then you come to the row below and you will do practically the same thing. You go row by column. So 6 multiplying negative 8, which will give us this, plus 2 multiplying negative 1. You notice we always go horizontal, then vertical. You do that for each instance. When you're done with that, you can just do the summation. 3 by negative 8 gives us negative 24. 1 by negative 1 gives us negative 1. And 3 by negative 3 gives us negative 9. 1 by 10 gives us 10. 6 by negative 8 gives us negative 48. 2 times negative 1 gives us negative 2. 6 by negative 3 gives us negative 18. 2 by 10 gives us 20. If we sum that up, vector, or oh sorry, matrix AM will give us negative 25, 1, negative 52. You see that? So I have solved the first for you. What would happen if we multiplied M by A instead of A by M? Would it be commutative? Do you remember commutativity? 2 plus 3 is 5. 3 plus 2 is 5. So addition is commutative. In this instance, would multiplication be commutative for matrices? Let's try it. If we tried it, we would have this. 8 by 3, negative 3 by 6. That gives us this. Our second instance, we would have negative 8 by 1, negative 3 by 2. We have that. And on and on. What we have eventually? We're going to have negative 42, negative 14, 57, 19. You notice that AM was not equal to MA. In other words, they were not commutative. With that in mind, let's go back to our assignment. And this will be something for you to try on your own. Try AB, BA, and BN. And let's know what you got out of it. What have we learned today? We have defined a matrix. We have been able to use the double suffix notation. We have learned how to represent a whole matrix using bold letters or a capital letter with a wavy line below it. We have also been able to describe row and column matrices using small letters. We have performed a few arithmetic operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication in two ways by a scalar and by another matrix. Before then, we were able to tell that two matrices are equal under the condition that first of all, they are of the same order, and secondly, that corresponding elements have the same value. It's been a great pleasure guiding you through this. In our second part, we shall be going even deeper into the subject of matrices. I hope you've learned a thing or two. Do well to take your notes. Do this exercise, revise them. I know the trouble spot is usually how to multiply a matrix by another matrix. But remember, it is horizontal, vertical. Horizontal from the first vertical for the second. This has been your facilitator on your senior high school R elective math class. My name is Danso. This is your Joy Learning channel. Until we see you again, keep learning. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.